so in the last video we looked at um, how a, a scheduler, an HLS scheduler, can translate um, the set of data and control dependencies in um, a program into a linear programming problem, solve that problem, and uh, produce legal values that represent a legal execution of the program. So now we're going to show how this uh, schedule, which is listed here under final schedule, gets um, translated into a finite state machine called an STG. So in the demo HLS system I'm using, uh, an STG is uh, the internal representation of a finite state machine. It's also the representation that's used uh, in the original Zhang scheduling paper. So just recall that for our simple store program, which has two instructions and takes a total of uh, four cycles, zero, one, two, and three to complete, um, we're basically going to spend the first three cycles doing a store, and then we're going to, on that, or the first four cycles, you could say, doing a store, and then in that fourth cycle, we're going to return. So the STG that's produced by um, that test case is printed out, and actually in the single store test case, the line STG is, is this line in the printout, and then this is the actual printout of the STG. So because the STG uh, well, because the solution to the linear programming problem we put in um, produces four different state uh, numberings, the STG, which is basically just a big finite state machine, uh, or a small one in this case, has four states. State 0, state 1, state 2, state 3. And there's, because there's no control flow, the transitions are very simple. So the state transitions are, if we're in state 0, go to state 1. If we're in state one, go to state two. If we're in state two, go to state three. If we're in state three, stay in state three. And notice that inside of the states, this is really a printout of which instructions execute in which states. And you can ignore this in. That's uh, that's just a bit of printout that I should eliminate. It's meaningless. Um, we've got the state transition down here, but then the state listing shows which instructions execute in which states. And remember that in the original framing of the scheduling problem, stores take three cycles to complete, so they get four. Uh, variables in the programming problem, and return takes zero cycles to complete, so it gets one variable in the scheduling problem. And in state zero, we start executing store. In state one, we're continuing to execute the store. State two, we're continuing to execute the store. In state three, this is the first state where the store is visible, uh, or where the effect of the store has actually occurred. And so we finish the store and we return. And notice that store gets four scheduling variables and it appears in four different subsequent states, right? Each one corresponding to one of the numberings of store. So store goes from zero to one to two to three and a store variable appears in state zero, state one, state two, and state three. And return only has one scheduling variable with value three, so it only appears in state three. So this first appearance of the store instruction means initiate, in, uh, initiate the store then this instruction, this store instruction instance, and this store instruction instance in states one and two just represents that we're doing the store, that the store is in progress. And then this last occurrence of the store variable represents that the store is finished. So hopefully you can see how for this very simple program with no control flow, how we basically transliterated um, the solution of this integer programming problem that we got out of the solver into a finite state machine that we can uh, convert into some usable hardware description language. And so, uh, in the next video, I'll talk about how we actually take this finite state machine and convert it into Verilog, what that Verilog looks like, um, and how it gets produced. And again, there it's also a pretty straightforward uh, transliteration of the state machine into a hardware description language with, you know, clocking and all of that. And then after that, uh, we'll look at some more complicated examples and uh, things like pipelining, handling internal memories, um, and other more real HLS topics. So we're almost at the end of uh, seeing how a very simple example goes through the full HLS flow.